Good afternoon. My name is David Cameron. I'm the director of the program on European Union studies uh, at the Macmillan Center of Yale. And uh, it's my um, pleasure uh, to uh, uh, moderate a conversation this afternoon with a number of people who are affiliated uh, with the Macmillan Center and with uh, Yale. Uh, we are focused on the uh, impact on, on democracy of the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and in particular, the question of whether uh, this is in some way um, creating a basis for um, a move to authoritarianism in some states, um, either greater authoritarianism than now exists or uh, democratic states that are moving under uh, the um, pressures of the pandemic toward um, something less than full uh, democracy. We're delighted to have uh, a number of experts uh, on uh, various parts of the world um, today, and I want to introduce them um, uh, to you, and then we'll proceed with a, uh, a discussion in which uh, each of them will speak for uh, a few minutes um, uh, on uh, the topic, and then we'll have a conversation back and forth among the panel members. Um, it's a pleasure for me first to introduce Ana Dulao, who is a uh, colleague of mine in the Department of Political Science uh, here at Yale. Uh, Ana has worked on uh, political economy in um, Latin America, uh, has written a number of works, including um, crafting policies to end poverty in Latin America. And uh, she's well versed to be able to speak uh, both about uh, democratic politics and less than full democratic politics in Latin America. Uh, Thais Gasparian uh, is an associate research scholar at Yale, at the Yale Law School. She's a lawyer and practices civil law in Brazil. Uh, she has served uh, in the past as the chief of staff in the Ministry of Justice in Brazil, and she's involved in a number of uh, commissions uh, dealing with uh, legal issues uh, in Brazil. So um, she's someone who is very knowledgeable about the law and civil law and uh, uh, challenges um, that might uh, be created um, to um, um, uh, civil law uh, under the pressures of um, the pandemic. Vish, uh, Vish uh, Saktival is a po postdoctoral associate uh, with the Council on Middle East Studies um, in the Macmillan Center. She's uh, an, a, an expert and authority on political Islam, contentious politics, and authoritarianism in uh, in particular in uh, North Africa. Uh, and uh, she is currently writing a book about uh, uh, Islam in modern uh, Algeria. And she's also written extensively in uh, various uh, media, the Washington Post, National Interest, uh, Foreign Affairs, and other publications. Um, uh, Nahid uh, Sam Dust, uh, Siam Dust is uh, a member of the anthropology department uh, at, at Yale and a postdoctoral associate uh, in the program in Iranian studies uh, as part of the Council on um, Middle, East, Middle East Studies in the Macmillan Center here at Yale. Um, and uh, she's also a lecturer in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. Uh, she works on the intersection between uh, politics and, and culture. Uh, she uh, published a book um, entitled uh, Soundtrack of the Revolution, The Politics of Music in Iran. Um, so we have uh, with uh, Naid someone who is uh, knowledgeable, uh, obviously uh, deeply knowledgeable about, um, about that um, complex polity. Uh, Aniko Sukhs, 
uh, is a postdoctoral associate um, in Macmillan also, and a lecturer on Russian, East European, and Eurasian studies. Uh, she um, uh, is now working on a manuscript uh, entitled uh, Contagious Files, uh, the Cultural Memory of State Surveillance in Hungary, and uh, is someone who will be able to uh, fill us in a bit on uh, what Mr. Orban uh, just did uh, in regard to um, his decree powers. Uh, Taisu Zhang um, is a professor of law uh, at the Yale Law School uh, and is a specialist on uh, Chinese law and Chinese politics. Uh, he's written about kinship and property in pre-industrial China and England. Uh, and he's now writing a book uh, on uh, the ideological foundations of the fiscal state uh, in China. Uh, he's a global faculty member um, of Peking University Law School. Uh, and also the current president of the International Society for Chinese Law and History. So we, we have a, um, a wonderful uh, group of um, panel members uh, and cover the world uh, quite broadly. And so I think uh, we'll, we'll start. And um, if uh, you don't mind uh, leading off, Anna, with... Um, uh, some comments, and then we'll um, go to Thais and go on uh, from there. Great. Um, thank you, David, and thank you to the Macmillan Center for organizing this webinar, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I will focus for the most part on Mexico and Central America, but I would like to start by giving a quick overview of, of, of how things uh, are looking right now in Latin America as a whole. So as you may know, uh, the region is facing a very tough situation. As of yesterday, there are 122,500 confirmed cases. 10,500 of those cases are in Mexico and about 7,000 of those cases are in Central America. Brazil has been hit the hardest in terms of number of cases with 47,000. But if we consider the number of cases per million inhabitants, the country that has been hit the hardest is Panama, followed by Ecuador, Peru, Chile, and the Dominican Republic. Um, on these numbers, however, as in many other regions, um, testing has been limited. So the total cases are likely many times higher than the confirmed cases. And there are two reasons why I'm afraid that excess mortality will be very high in some places in the region. And to start with, um, um, as is perhaps no surprise, healthcare systems are not prepared in the region to deal with this pandemic. And they are about to get a very difficult stress test. Latin America is one of the most unequal regions in the world. And for many people, staying home for an extended period really doesn't seem possible because that would threaten their livelihood. And it's very hard to estimate exactly the, the, the number of people who are vulnerable to this, but just to give you a sense, uh, 154 million people or 56% of workers in the region operate in the informal sector, which means that they do not have job security. And to make matter worse, for many people, frequent hand washing is challenging. So um, my, my, my concern is that it's going to be very hard to flatten the curve in some of these areas. Um, now, the second reason why I think this is going to be difficult is because in, in Latin America, and I'm going to focus particularly in the challenge, challenging context in Mexico, migrants and refugees are a very vulnerable population. They lack access to healthcare and social distancing is basically impossible, especially for those people who are stranded in the camps in the southern US-Mexico uh, border. So as the New York Times says, I think this could really become a humanitarian disaster. Uh, now, some governments have responded early to the pandemic. Some have dragged their feet and some like uh, in Nicaragua have not even responded yet. Uh, notoriously, presidents in Mexico and Brazil downplayed the threat. Uh, 
uh, and Thais will speak about the case of Brazil, but in Mexico, Lopez Obrador's administration delayed most of the quarantine measures that other Latin American countries had already implemented. And on the other extreme, we have in El Salvador, Bukele who quarantined the country even before it had confirmed cases. And the response of governments has also varied in terms of its stringency. In Mexico, the government is urging people to stay home. They have closed the schools. And in the end of March, the government shut down all non-essential activities. And in Central America, except for Nicaragua, all countries have quarantined, have ordered curfews and closed borders. El Salvador has taken the most stringent of the measures with even some constitutional rights temporarily restricted as early as mid-March. So I think that it's early to tell exactly what the effects of the pandemic will be on the political systems of these countries. But I, in terms of democratic backsliding, I see four red flags. Um, in Mexico, I think that checks and balances to the executive power were already weakening before COVID-19. And I see no reason uh, for this trend to reverse. Lopez Obrador party controls a majority in the lower house of Congress, and it's very close to controlling two thirds of the Senate. Uh, in his few years in office, he has appointed four out of 11 uh, Supreme Court judges. He has attacked autonomous agencies, including the National Institute for Access to Information and the Electoral Institute, and he recently revamped his attack on free media. And perhaps uh, equally worrisome for the, for, for, for the current circumstances, he is dismantling a state capacity. And so far, he has refused to change his economic and social policy plans, and considering both the health and the economic crisis that are coming, I think both will fall, fall very short and they will definitely not help him achieve his goal of ending corruption and putting poor people first, as he likes to say. Uh, and just to give you an example, his social policies target people who are about to enter the labor market or who are retired, and they do not reach the millions of people or that, that, that work, but work in the informal sector and those who work in the formal sector who will very likely lose their jobs and likely be livelihoods in the next few months. So I think that we should keep an eye on what Lopez Obrador makes uh, uh, and the decisions he takes once the economy unravels and perhaps his popularity starts to fall. In particular, we should pay attention to the midterm and local elections next year. Uh, the second uh, red flag that I, that I see is in El Salvador, and maybe you already sort of uh, perceive this, uh, given what they, the measures that they have taken. Some analysts really worry that Bukele is using COVID-19 as an excuse to continue militarizing the country. And as I mentioned, uh, constitutional rights have been uh, temporarily suspended, so that it's particularly worrisome. The third red flag I see is the continued presence of non-state actors with immense economic power in many of these countries. And it's early to tell, but I think we should keep an eye on how organized crime and drug cartels would react to the pandemic. In particular, I worry that they will use this crisis as an opportunity to expand their grip on communities and use their excess cash liquidity uh, or wealth liquidity to buy elections. And finally, the last red flag that I want to mention is that many countries in Latin America saw massive protests with very legitimate demands before COVID-19. And these uh, protests went from Guatemala, Nicaragua, Honduras, Mexico, and many other countries in the Southern Cone. I think that um, the right to protest must be fully guaranteed once the health emergency passes. And I think it's going to be very challenging for governments to deal with uh, social unrest, and particularly because they will be cash strapped. So we should really pay attention on how governments are gonna deal with social unrest uh, once the pandemic uh, allows people to go back to the streets. And so just in sum, I don't see COVID-19 is unveiling new autocrats in the region, but I do see that perhaps it's speeding up some of the backsliding that had already begun uh, before COVID-19. Thank you.
Great, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Anna. Um, Thais, would you like to um, uh, take the microphone? Yes. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? It's okay? Fine. Okay. Uh, so thank you for inviting me to be with you today. I'm very honored with this invitation. And thank you, David, for your presentation. And also, uh, Anna, for your Latin America view, point of view, because it's um, much what I'm going to tell you today. It's uh, you have already pointed out. So uh, last Sunday, our president, uh, Bolsonaro, he participated in demonstrations in Brasilia, our capital, where, where protesters called for military intervention. They also shouted against the Congress and the Supreme Court. They wanted the Supreme Court and the Congress to be closed. And they made pressure for an end of the social isolation uh, recommended by the health authorities. That's more or less similar what's happening uh, in US, but the difference is that the president joined the crowd, he coughed in front of groups of people without wearing a mask, obviously, risking not only his own health, but of others. And he defended the violation of democratic order, shouting, I am the constitution. It's unknown whether the, pres the president is uh, an idiot or whether he is an authoritarian, there is an authoritarian logic behind his speech. Since the impeachment of President Dilma Rousseff uh, two years ago, the country has been divided by polarized political opinions. On the right, the, uh, which um, Bolsonaro comes from, uh, an anti-democratic and bigoted mentality has been gained force, as if there were not enough, an anti-scientific wave has also risen. The president's mentor says that nothing disproves the conjecture that the earth is flat. That's what we are living here. So unlike many government officials who would have taken advantage of the pandemic situation to take severe measures and gain political support, Bolsonaro opted for denialism. He stands as one of the rare cases of a head of state who despite being authoritarian, doesn't recognize the seriousness of the crisis and does not use it for his own end. But the president has been attempting initiatives uh, that limit uh, liberties and freedom. Recently, he added provisions in a bill that exempted the government from providing information for the population. The bill was not approved thanks to the mobilization of the society, but one wonders for how long this can last. And because of the coherent speech the president addressed to people, he lost in popularity and is isolated politically. Some voice the opinion that Bolsonaro's disconnected messages would serve as a political armor to prevent the inevitable economic and social effect of the pandemic from being used against him in the race for the elections in 2022. Oh, about, the, about his popularity, although he remains at 30% approval rates, the president's popularity has dropped a lot since his election. Many politicians who supported him a year ago are now his opponents. I want to, uh, to put in a slide here. I'm just going to share my screen. I don't know if it's going to, to work, but here you can see um, Bolsonaro's popularity before and after the pandemia. So in the left side, my left side, uh, you can see the red trace is horrible. It stands for horrible or um, very bad uh, popularity. And the, the turquoise, I, uh, the light blue, it stands for very, very good. And the dark uh, green stands for a regular. So you can see that after the pandemic, uh, the red, uh, red trace is very, 
is much higher and the, his approval of very good and regular has dropped, has been dropped. So that's uh, a graph that I wanted to, to show you. Uh, today, there are 35 million Brazilians without access of, to running water. Instructions uh, on uh, washing hands and buying hand sanitizer seems completely ironic and nearly useless. The situation on, in the pure, uh, poor communities as the favelas, slums, offers no conditions for social distance, as Anna has uh, just told. Large families live in houses just one room without any um, privacy. In 2018, uh, long before the coronavirus crisis, the number of Brazilians living in under the extreme poverty line reached 13 million, with people living on less than $1 a day. It's not difficult to understand that for a huge number of Brazilians, the president's speech against social isolation makes more sense than the recommendation of doctors uh, dressed uh, on white, uh, in white, uh, who they see on TV. Brazil is the sixth worst country in the world in terms of social inequality. In such a diverse country with such different social conditions, the poorest will be we certainly be the population uh, most affected by the, the pandemic. Also, not much attention has been paid to the situation in the Brazilian prisons, which are completely overcrowded and with, with extremely poor hygiene. Brazil has one of the largest prison population in the world. And uh, when the pandemic arrives in prisons, the perverse correlation, correlation relation of pandemic and social inequality will be made very, very clear. Thus, the situation with the pandemic in Brazil tends to be more calamitous than everything, than anything ever witnessed before. We are frightened that people will then agree to exchange their liberties for security. The urgency that will be necessary to, to face the, uh, the crisis will certainly facilitate the adoption or future measures of exception that limit freedoms. In early, so just to give you an example, in early April, the Minister of Economy stated that democracy gets in the way. We all know that the adoption of democratic routines and methods is very slow. Democracy is not efficient when we are in a hurry. This point of view might explain the common sense of the population who take to the streets asking for military intervention. In short, what we see in the country is a propitious scenario for chaos that will be shared by a goofball, a madman, with a team totally insensitive to social issues and human rights. It's not yet clear how the president will benefit from this situation or what political use he will make from it. But at least, at least we have, it's clear that with each verbal assault against the democratic order, the Congress and the judiciary are strongly positioned in the defense of constitutional principles. It's true that the authoritarian wave is, uh, is uh, accelerating worldwide. Some health policies, as, uh, such as uh, confinement or cell phone tracking, may be implemented and will bring uh, a great deal of intrusion into people's lives. The question is to what extent people will be willing to exchange liberties for safe and economic uh, stability. With regard to the presidency of the Republic, Brazil is completely, seems to be completely adrift. A few weeks ago, a journalist asked to the Vice President, Antonio Milton Mourão, who, uh, who used to be a general in Brazilian army, if the situation, so the journalist asked him, if the situation was under control in the country, to which the general um, replied, the situation is under control, 
we just do not know by who. That's, that's the view from Brazil. That's the, the problem here in Brazil. Thank you. You will have to unmute. Yes. Yeah. At, <laughs> at, times, at times, I thought you were talking about this country um, uh, in terms of the presidency. Um, very, very interesting um, and a nice uh, comparison also with what uh, Anna said earlier. Um, Vish, uh, uh, would you like to tell us uh, uh, how you see the problem from your vantage point? So uh, thank you, Thais and Anna, for sort of breaking down uh, the South American and Latin American scenario. Um, my remarks will shift just ever so slightly to focus on how the COVID-19 crisis is affecting social movements and public life under authoritarian regimes. Um, and I focus on the case of North Africa. And for the sake of time and scope, I'll focus on Algeria specifically today. Um, but I'll be happy to sort of compare and engage um, the Moroccan situation, you know, maybe in the, in the Q&A discussion. Um, so obviously, it's been sort of widely commented upon that in times of crisis, you know, the coronavirus of today, uh, you know, the 9-11 of yesterday and the subsequent global war on terror, that um, regimes, especially Arab authoritarian regimes, will sort of instrumentalize these periods to consolidate power, uh, limit freedoms, and control the nature and flow of information. Um, but the Algerian, uh, you know, my research in Algeria and the Algerian scenario broadly sort of shows a bit more of a complicated picture. And so I'm going to talk a little bit today, very briefly, about Algeria's recent uh, anti-government protest movement called Hirak. Um, which though it has sort of definitely been reshaped by COVID-19, it has not been ultimately put down or sidelined by the current health crisis or by the sort of unhinged authoritarian repression that many assumed would ensue. And in fact, uh, the, the Algerian regime is perhaps a bit more hamstrung than many similar governments in confronting the crisis, precisely because the sort of sweeping unilateral top-down uh, technocratic response would invite the very accusations of authoritarian power grabbing that has created the current crisis of legitimacy uh, to begin with. And so in turn, the sort of tentative response that the Algerian government has been compelled to take has ironically fed, you know, fed their protest movement's narrative of state ineptitudes. So just a, just a little bit of background about the movement. Um, it was formed in 2019 in protest against uh, President Abdelaziz Bouteflika's announcement that he would run for a fifth term. And in April of last year, it brought to an end his 20 year rule. And over the year, Hirak has morphed into sort of this massive uh, nationwide movement that is sort of unanimously calling for a complete overhaul of the Algerian political system. And I would say, and I think others would agree that it's probably among the most significant uh, unformalized non-state sort of entities to arise against the sitting government uh, in modern uh, you know, Algerian memory. Um, up until Hirak's formation, sort of anti-system sentiment in Algeria had been sort of um, kind of hush-hush, something that you sort of say behind closed doors in private um, among people that you trust. Um, but the sort of mass support that Hirak has been able to mobilize over the last year has sort of exposed these sort of anti-state sentiments as much more widespread, therefore kind of normalizing and, and sort of making more legible um, these very public expressions of dissent and kind of outwardly uh, revealing, uh, you know, people's actual preferences, as well as the state's sort of utter lack of legitimacy and public trust. And, you know, over the course of Hirak, therefore, um, you know, streets and public squares became these sort of sites of the renegotiation of the imagined Algerian future, uh, sites of unity where diverse um, and even opposing camps, you know, uh, religious groups, secularists, Islamists sort of came together to um, sort of redefine uh, belonging in the Algerian body politic through a uh, rejection of the status quo arrangements of power. And, um, you know, where public space has sort of been implicitly state surveilled for decades, occupying space in this way sort of together gave many citizens a sort of renewed sense of uh, civic ownership and also this type of patriotism that could be delinked from performances of loyalty to the state, but now instead through, uh, you know, loyalty to the fellow Algerian, which we see now is being marshaled in how Hirak is handling the coronavirus. And so, 
one of the major ways I see coronavirus as kind of changing the nature of uh, contentious politics and social movements, which of course we know is a hallmark of you know, functioning democratic cultures and also an important check on authoritarian power is effectively by stripping these movements of their most fundamental uh, resource, which is you know, space, physical space, public space, and its occupation um, is sort of a critical site and mode of claim making for social movements everywhere. And so to contend with this new loss of space, which in many ways, perhaps symbolically, is back in the hands of authorities because of the lockdown, um, Hirak is sort of changing its mobilizational tactics to refocus its grievances on the state's management of the health crisis. It's shifting its mode of anti-state contention from weekly protests, which it can no longer do, to instead online activism and new grievances and, and demands that sort of call out the widening gaps in Algeria's health infrastructure, its governance and its leadership, as well as towards efforts in forging a maybe more prominent larger role in um, health service provision and even policy on health. Um, so, you know, now Hirak has almost entirely changed its repertoire of activities. It's, uh, you know, it's galvanizing aid, food and medical supply shipments to vulnerable areas. It's launching crowdfunding campaigns to distribute uh, PPE to those in need. And it's effectively morphing into this sort of massive charitable network. And it has also leveraged the medical expertise within the movement's own ranks to form educational groups in localities all over the country to sort of create credible awareness and public messaging campaigns, um, uh, you know, to disinfect public areas and things like this. And framing these changes in modes of action as filling the gaps of the state in this way sort of works to confirm public distrust on this. And also it works also to sort of more symbolically, uh, you know, trespass on the state's mantle as this sort of benevolent you know, benevolent providential figure, which is a concept that a lot of authoritarian regimes rely on for legitimacy. And so this issue of public trust in turn has sort of presented a paradox, of course, to the regime's management of the crisis, not only because it was unable to uh, more swiftly elicit uh, popular behavior change, you know, like staying home and maintaining distance, but also because it just made it much more politically costly to take on the sort of strident measures that its neighbors, like say Morocco, was able to take in the early stages to curb transmission. For instance, the state could only really implement curfew lockdowns and in some harder hit localities, uh, mandatory confinement after the seriousness of, of the pandemic became more inescapably clear uh, to the public. And the government still has not uh, been sort of able to uh, declare a nationwide state of emergency as neighboring countries have done. Um, and when it did ban gatherings in early March, to the protesters or not. And so this very sort of tentativeness has in turn sort of dampened public confidence and confirmed the narrative of a slow and unprepared government that the public needs to fill in for. Uh, and finally, even though, uh, you know, President Abdelmajid Taboun, who was ele elected, uh, you know, during the Hirak movement this past year and has sort of near zero popular legitimacy, you know, he promised, uh, you know, sufficient ICU beds, respirators and test kits a few weeks back, uh, Hirak's medical professionals came out warning that, you know, soon these are reach gonna, you know, these, are, these will soon reach capacity and insufficient testing and detection medical supply rationing is soon gonna expose even more layers of state corruption and mismanagement, um, you know, all of which is probably going to serve as even more fodder for dissent on the part of the Algerian public. And so to conclude really quickly, um, you know, crises like COVID-19 can be great for authoritarian regimes and Algeria's neighbor, Morocco may actually a better, you know, may, may be a better example of this where the government's response has been a bit more popular um, despite people's distrust of the health infrastructure and has reinforced the seeming uh, competency of the technocratic state that is sort of headed uh, up by the monarchy. And if, when we contrast this to the Algerian scenario, what is shown is that COVID-19 can kind of help authoritarian consolidation only if certain requirements are met. And that's namely uh, the issues I mentioned of uh, public trust and um, legitimacy. <clears throat> um, and I'll stop there, my comments. Okay, thanks very much, Vish. Um, and I think we turn uh, to Nahid. Uh, 
Great. So I'll, I'll be speaking about Iran, though I'm happy to answer questions about the wider Middle East um, in the Q&A section. Um, but if, similarly to Vish, I think in order to explain what's been happening in Iran, I need to provide a context as to where Iran was, where the Iranian state was in terms of state society relations leading into the pandemic. And, um, you know, as you all know, Iran has been under severe sanctions um, by the U.S. and by extension, the rest of the sort of Western world since really 1979. But these sanctions got a whole lot worse uh, with the Trump administration, with its maximum pressure campaign, which openly seeks to bring down the Islamic Republic. Um, and so as part of these sanctions in May 2019, uh, the U.S. also put a ban on the sale of Iranian oil, uh, which led to the economy to contract even further, now down sort of by 15% uh, and its currency to devalue by 70%. And in November, um, the government decided to cut fuel subsidies, which led to widespread national protests um, that became very violent and in which um, the state uh, forces killed some up to a thousand people. The, the state actually itself has never um, published any numbers as to how many people were killed in those protests, but people think up to a thousand people were killed, which was unprecedented in the history of violence vis-a-vis -vis protests in post-revolutionary Iran. Um, and so the population was um, really in a state of shock and the state's uh, legitimacy at an absolute low um, toward the end of 2019. And then um, in early January, on January 3rd, U.S. forces in a targeted strike killed General Ghassem Soleimani, a generally well-liked uh, general in, in Iran, even across political lines. And this, for a few days, brought together a lot of different Iranian uh, people of different political backgrounds and factions and created a sort of unity that was widely televised on, on state media and um, really created a sort of uh, gave the state a reprieve from what had happened in November uh, with the protests. Um, but this sort of honeymoon period didn't actually last long because then uh, a few days later on January 8th, Iran shut down the Ukrainian airliner leaving Tehran, which uh, uh, it admitted only a few days later, killing all 176 people on board. And the fact that the state took three to four days to admit to its wrongdoing and admit that it had shut down the airliner really created a legitimacy of a major legitimacy crisis for the state. People poured into the street into the streets again. There were widespread protests again. And um, while this was happening, the state, um, you know, was really hunkering down for a worse sort of turnout for the parliamentary elections on February 21st which materialized the low turnout of 42%, the lowest ever since um, the um, 1979 revolution for parliamentary elections. And so it was really against this backdrop that Corona entered the, uh, the picture in, in, in Iran. The first cases were confirmed on February 17th in Qom, the holy city of Qom, where you know, it has something like 20 million visitors every year and is a really big Shiite hub in Iran with people coming both from the East and the West, from Iraq, Lebanon, from uh, Afghanistan, India and Pakistan. And so it's a real hub for, for people uh, in the region. Um, and uh, those first cases that appeared, the government, like elsewhere, not unlike in the US and elsewhere, was really downplaying the threat of the virus. And only on uh, February, sort of a, about a week or so later, the state start admitting that uh, Corona was appearing in um, appearing to be a problem in Iran and shut down universities and schools. But even so, it really dragged its feet on shutting down shrines and mosques. And uh, uh, even though it was appearing as an epicenter of the virus in the region, it really dragged its feet on uh, shutting down those religious centers. And eventually, by the end of February, this happened. Um, in fact, considering the strong response to protesters back in November, it was really surprising how little enforcement the state was taking in public spaces. Um, by March, the messaging from national media was clear, stay home, there were banners and posters all around uh, the country, but it still hadn't implemented any kind of quarantine or lockdown. So people were advised and uh, recommended to stay home and to uh, not travel, but even ahead of the New Year celebration, which happens on the 21st of March in Iran, there were images of, um, you know, packed bazaars in Tehran, people shopping and so on. So it wasn't being enforced uh, on the streets. Um, eventually, on, a, on the cultural level, in trying to really get people to understand the 
the uh, severity of the of the disease, uh, state television stepped in and uh, was running programs, including a film about Avicenna uh, from back in the 11th century, uh, introducing, you know, narrating the story of him introducing the method of quarantine uh, as an Iranian medical intervention. And this really found resonance with Iranians because they now, you know, were claiming that quarantine is actually an Iranian concept. And so this was adopted across um, not just Iran, but also the Persian speaking region, Tajikistan, Afghanistan. The film was also broadcast. Um, the point is that the, you know, the in, in order sort of enforcement of the public was really happening on a cultural level and a sort of suggestive level. But as far as the streets and public spaces were concerned, sure, universities and schools were shut down, uh, mosques a bit later. Um, but it really took a while for, um, and then, you know, the state sent in these trucks with huge sprays to disinfect public spaces as a show of Corona being a security threat. Um, uh, and by the end of March, death numbers had already surpassed 3,000. So all this was happening while Iran was clearly being seen across the world as an epicenter um, of, the, of the virus. Um, but all in all, when we look at Iran as an authoritarian state, it didn't carry out the kinds of measures that we saw in China or the United Arab Emirates or even now Turkey. Um, indeed, coming out of a really contentious period following the November protests and then the downing of the Ukrainian airliner, it appeared the government wanted to take a soft approach and perhaps avoid the, any kind of confrontation in the streets. It was the hardliners and the Revolutionary Guard that kept advocating for stronger measures, something that was in fact then welcomed by the public. So the moderate government was taking a sort of you know, soft approach and not really enforcing too much. Uh, meanwhile, the hardliners and the Revolutionary Guard, which had been the, which had been the body that sur um, that um, uh, had uh, suppressed the de demonstrator, demonstra demonstrators in November and killed up to a thousand people. They were the ones who were now advocating for stronger measures, and that was actually being welcomed by the public. I'll speak to what that could, you know, what that sort of tells us in a little bit. Um, amidst what appeared to be a power struggle between the moderate government and the hardliners and the Revolutionary Guards, it was really Iran's healthcare system that I think we must credit for what is a relatively low death rate at about 5,600 today. Um, some sources say that those numbers are not correct and uh, that the government's downplaying the extent of the disaster. In fact, there was a parliamentary, parliamentary fact-finding commission just several days ago that uh, released a report saying that the number of those dead is uh, about two times the number of official um, uh, of the official number and the number of those infected about five times. The government says it's about 88,000 people. So they're saying it must be five times that number considering the death ratio of uh, those dead and those infected. So even if we go by about 10,000 uh, dead today, um, that is, um, you know, in comparison to other countries, much better endowed with better medical systems, um, such as France or Italy or, or Spain, um, that's not such a high number. And I think in, it, it has, it's been sort of a narrative that has been percolating to the top, which is, you know, that Iran's healthcare system, which was still slowly built up uh, after 1979 with a vast network of community health workers and primary healthcare centers around the country, a uh, system that the WHO at one point uh, described as an incredible masterpiece, um, has really stepped in to uh, become the hero of the nation in terms of um, blocking the the worst, uh, you know, the worst outcomes of of, of this uh, this pandemic in Iran. And uh, since the outbreak, the system has sent out mobile health stations that have carried out uh, case finding and contact tracing all across Iran. And at about 1.7 hospital beds per 1,000 people, Iranian emergency rooms were never at full capacity. Um, the state has spent 16% uh, of its budget to take care of those in greatest need through foods and loans and, and so on. But there's great discontent uh, across Iran because apparently those, those aids are not being delivered sufficiently and um, uh, are trickling down very slowly. Um, and as you might know, the U.S. is now blocking Iran's request to the IMF for the $5 billion, uh, billion dollar loan, um, the first such request since the 1979 revolution. And so I think what this tells us is that, you know, it has been argued that it's not so much regime type authoritarianism or liberal democracy, but state capacity to deal with crises that can best indicate the path of these, of the disease in different countries. Uh, but even by this standard, if we look at sort of um, 
you know, state capacity, Iran is a baffling case. The government itself has not been very proactive. It has not imposed strict quarantine or lockdown. And it's not clear that in, in, this, in its divided system between elected and unelected bodies, it would be able to muster the kind of state capacity required to deal with a public health crisis of this magnitude. Um, but I think what has been sort of coming, you know, more and more as a story to the surface is again, this underlying healthcare system as well as civil society's engagement early on. So early on when there was a shortage of goods of uh, face masks and other kinds of uh, PPE, uh, personal protection equipment, people started making masks in their small factories or in their homes and distributing them. There were uh, groups of women going around and disinfecting things like ATMs and public phones and all kinds of, um, you know, most touch sort of public surfaces. And, uh, and I think another factor that accounts for the lower death rate is probably Iran's young population, um, you know, compared to other populations of a similar size, like the countries I mentioned, like Spain, Italy, and France. And so what we see is that, you know, coming out of a real crisis of legitimacy following the protests in November and the downing of the Ukrainian airliner, the government kind of sort of took a backseat approach. And in taking a backseat approach, what has what the society has revealed is that is its self-sufficiency and uh, sufficiency and um, its own activism in really trying to uh, keep the numbers down and help each other. There are lots and lots of stories all around social media of people helping each other and their neighbors and uh, making sure that, you know, in neighborhoods, people know who's sick and who's not and, and coming to each other's aids. And so I think coming out of the Corona crisis, what I see is, um, is an even greater strengthening of, uh, of sentiments around self-sufficiency and the civil society, which had been crushed to a great extent in the post-2009 securitization of politics and public space in, in Iran. Um, I think I'll, I'll end with that. Great, thank you very much, Nahid. Uh, I think now we go to uh, Aniko. Aniko? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Nahi, thank you so much for this amazing presentation. It's so funny because Orban is definitely not taking a backseat approach. So <laughs> what we're going to see is something very, very different. Can you all hear me? Because my mic is a little hidden. Um, and also, thank you, Asia, Christine, and Kathleen for organizing this event. And uh, David, we're so honored that you agreed to host. Um, so in my talk, I will first focus on the political events that took place in Hungary during the last month as a response to the COVID-19 crisis virus. As much as we can draw some parallels between the Hungarian government and uh, the other authoritarian regimes in the Central and Eastern European region, such as the ruling Law and Justice Party in Poland or the new Slovenian government led by Janis Janza, I will argue that Prime Minister Viktor Orban's focus on his self-image and his performance as a commanding leader is distinctive from the anti-democratic measures with which other prime ministers and presidents have attempted to utilize the epidemics to grant their power. So I will also focus on Hungary and we can discuss the other countries in the region later. I would be especially to he curious to hear what other um, scholars have to say about the other countries. To take the most advantage of this short amount of time, I will first provide a brief summary of Fidesz government's legal responses to the crisis most importantly of the authorization uh, law, something that David has already mentioned, uh, that has been widely discussed in the international media. Then uh, I will turn to Orban, Orban's lesser known populist performative actions, the ones through which he makes himself seen as a paternalistic and seemingly authoritative, but not authoritarian. And that's, some, that's an interesting distinction that I want to think along with you leader who is dedicated to the protection of his people under any and all circumstances. This analysis will be informed by the interdisciplinary field of performance studies, my research area, which allows me to analyze performances of politics along with political performances. So let me, first let me briefly guide you through Prime Minister Viktor Orban's coup d'etat that took place on March 30th, 2020. 
At this time, the Hungarian parliament passed a law in which it suspended its own power and authorized Viktor Orban to rule by decree for an indefinite period of time. And I want to emphasize that this, this was what's so outrageous, that there is a state of emergency in plenty of countries. We've just heard uh, plenty of examples. But the fact that it is for an indefinite period of time, that that, that really opens a new door. And in Hungary, the emergency powers can be lifted only with the support of the two thirds of the parliament, which is exactly a majority that Orban holds. So it really is up to uh, Orban's people at this point if this emergency will ever end. It is also important to uh, cl clarify that even with Orban's present, uh, present ruling by decree, the parliament continues its legislative work. Now, this is something that I think was confused very often in the international media. Uh, the parliament is, is still working, and as a result, it is difficult to identify new laws and rules that were introduced as governmental decrees and bills that the uh, Fidesz controlled, that's his party, Fidesz controlled parliament chose to propose and pass during the time of the epidemics. Um, again, there has been a real confusion about this, both within the national and in the international media. Orban has issued some 70 decrees so far, according to Gabor Halmai, a constitutional scholar. Uh, some of the decrees include obliterating data protection in Hungary, obliterating the worker protections in the labor code, and permitting the government to take charge of public companies, just taking hold of them. Uh, and so these are the decrees, these are Orban's decrees, but simultaneously, uh, the parliament also established in some bills that, for instance, and here I quote, the spreading false information or true facts distorted in a way that could impede or thwart the effectiveness of defense measures against the coronavirus is punishable of one to five years of imprisonment. In other words, if you say something that the government deems as untrue, you can be in prison now. Uh, the Minister of Human Resources, Miklos Kachler, declared that hospitals are required to ev evacuate 36,000 beds and send home thousands of chronically ill and post-traumatic patients who are in need of long-term rehabilitation, violating international disability and human rights. And there are speculations as to why this was necessary in a country that at the moment has a total of 2,383 cases. Um, which I will gladly address in the Q&A, but for the sake of time for now, let's just note that they emptied 36,000 beds in Hungary, hospital beds. Uh, then there was a legislation bill that proposed to cut the status of about 25,000 state employees working in the cultural sectors in museums and theaters. Uh, there was another uh, bill that uh, proposed uh, to classify all information about a Chinese railway investment in the country, of which we know very little about. And another one which, ban which would ban transgender people to legally change their sex in the birth registry after transitioning. Um, simultaneously, they also tried to limit the power of the municipal governments, but there was such a strong pushback there, even from their own people, as it, at this time, municipal governments have a lot, of, a lot of important work to do, that they actually withdrawn their attempt. As Anna Applebaum points out in her op-ed for The Atlantic, these issues, most of these issues at least, uh, don't have the remotest relevance to the uh, pandemic. And that's such an important point. They are so irrelevant. Like if you think about trans transgender rights, Chinese railways, these are, these are the kind of uh, laws that have that been proposed. Instead, I want to propose that it allows Orban to cynically transform his illiberal democracy, a term he has proudly owned after his 2010 victory into a dictatorial regime. The legal explanation that the parliament provided for the necessity of these emergency measurements was to, and here I quote the law itself, to guarantee uh, for Hungarian citizens the safety of life and health, personal safety, the safety of assets, the legal certainty, as well as the stability of the national economy. So it's all about our safety uh, that the government is providing for. Just opposing the words of the law, with Orban's public performances since the belatedly established state of emergency allows us to demonstrate how he seizes this moment to re-establish himself as a paternalistic authoritative uh, father figure who protects his people from the gravest dangers that are lurking to attack from the outside. And irony is intended here. In this way, Orman's performance is genealogically linked to the post-Stalinist communist dictators of Eastern Europe, disguising the dis disenfranchisement and oppression of people under the kitschy performances of excessive power and paternalistic care. And just as a side note, something interesting that I think is happening here is that, that uh, historians have uh, 
have always connected Orban to the Islamophobic and nationalistic militant Hungarian governor of the 1930s, Miklos Horthy, who was one of the extreme, extreme right figures who very much wanted to become allies with Nazi Germany. But I do think that the way he, the way um, Orban performs himself in this new role of the of the of the Oh, I want to use the term dictator in control is very much, it, it, it follows a different tradition. If we listen carefully to the words of the law, we may better understand why Orban is still enjoys the majority of the support of his country. Through this description, we may capture not only the legal and the ideological, but also the effective reg register through which Orban solidifies his dictatorial power. Orban, since the earliest days of the epidemics, has regularly attended hospitals, and demonstrated that he's in full control of the epidemic. And I would love to show some pictures. So let me, sh let me see if I can just share my screen with you. I should be able to do so. Okay. So this is just a graffiti. And as you can see, he was there to welcome the Chinese shipments at the airport to control what control all the health equipment that arrives. Um, he personally was very much in control of, of, of these transactions. And then he also, sorry, let me see. Then he also went to each and every hospital uh, starting in April. Uh, every day he attended a different uh, hospital and uh, he made sure that he, uh, he checked the state of those hospitals and something that you can see that I think is quite funny. This is him, this is him. And then, then this is one of his last visits on April 9th is that even his gear, gear has increasingly reflected on both the severity of the danger and the readiness of the Hungarian hospitals to fight this invisible enemy. And of course here I'm referencing, um, unfortunately, Trump's um, language. Um, these images unfold a visual narrative of an omnipotent and omnipresent leader who is personally in charge of the health and well-being of his country. It is this performance of the country's leader that evokes the paternalistic protection of a Communist Party general secretary who regularly overperformed their fatherly control. So what you can see here is that he attended all the hospitals and simultaneously the images that started to circulate uh, were the hospitals that uh, that forced uh, thousands of patients home. Um, as the directors of the numerous hospitals were forced to send thousands of patients home, images of empty hospitals rooms perfectly prepared for the virus were introduced in the national media, contrasting the images of horror and death in Italy, Spain, and the United States. So these were the, these are the images that, that the national media uh, presents in Hungary. And these images unfold the visual narrative of an omnipotent and omnipresent leader who is personally in charge of the health and well-being of the country. It is this performance of the country's leader that evokes the paternalistic protection of a communist uh, party general. And here we have an example of Janusz Gader in 1981, who regularly overperformed their uh, fatherly control and embraced their people. It is also here, I would argue, that Orban departs from the other regional and I suspect some global leaders. Since he moved past his early trivialization of the virus, he has created, um, he has created uh, I, uh, a new visual narrative for himself on one which spectacularizes uh, his pro protective actions, while the puppet lawmakers in the background ensure that his dictatorship will be total and undefeatable by the time the epidemic is over. Through this short presentation, my intention was to locate the tension between, the, uh, between that which is nationally and internationally is visible and that which is invisible. While the extensive discussions of the authorization law uh, successfully drew the international political and legal community's attention to the dangers of the unprecedented unconstitutional act, the actual effects of the law is almost invisible to the Hungarian people for now, at least for now. Simultaneously, the excessive performance of power that manifests itself in the paternalistic care and control is what accessible to locals. And buying into this populist performance is what may solidify Orban's regime for another decade or more, even more. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Anika. Um, and now we turn to Taisu, um, yeah. who will probably be saying something about China. Yes. Um, 
so unlike uh, the many of the other countries that we've been, to we've been talking about, there's nothing going on in China that could be described as a transition. Or China was fully authoritarian before this. It is fully authoritarian after this. Um, the interesting things to talk about are all about basically how the underlying politics of that authoritarianism have actually acted uh, upon the pandemic. So we're, I think we're almost a little bit over time, so I'll, I'll try to be really quick. Uh, the, Chinese, the Chinese response can be relatively cleanly separated into two, into two, two different phases uh, to the coronavirus. The first probably when, you know, like depending on how, how early you think the Chinese government actually was aware of the coronavirus, I mean, the most reasonable estimates right now are something like late November or early December. Um, from that point up until basically like late January, uh, the government was in pretty much like, like all of the worst habits of the Chinese government were pretty much on display. Um, local bureaucrats fearful of not meeting their own growth targets or fearful of basically being reprimanded for causing social unrest, uh, basically tried to cover up the entire thing. At some point, the central government became aware, but the central government also um, was collaborating with local governments for quite some time from late December onwards uh, and kind of like downplaying the severity of the crisis. Uh, and this all has a certain kind of like obvious authoritarian logic to it. Uh, the government is heavily, heavily reliant, reliant upon performance-based legitimacy. And any kind of like major social panic leading to economic down, leading to economic problems um, that are triggered by this by this um, epidemic would be of you know, serious cost to the state's political standing. So initially, the the urge both up and down the bureaucracy was to downplay, to cover up, uh, to basically try to maintain a semblance of peace and normalcy. Uh, I think everyone can agree this dramatically backfired and led to like this massive explosion of cases in Wuhan that basically, even to this day, we don't know the full extent of how serious the, the epidemic actually was in Wuhan and Hubei province. Um, from the end of January onwards, the government finally kind of owned up to the problem. The entire Chinese machinery, the entire machinery of the Chinese bureaucracy went into full motion. And at, but from that point onwards, it's been relatively, I, I think like, you know, it's very easy to be angry um, if you're outside of China at basically what's been going on inside the Chinese bureaucracy, but I, I think any objective measurement would have to acknowledge that from something like January 30th onwards, uh, the Chinese government has been extremely effective in managing the overall epidemic and managing the, the shutdown and then the opening up process. Um, it basically shut the entire country down to, with a rigor that pretty much cannot be, cannot be um, copied virtually anywhere outside of China. The, the, Chinese, the, the Chinese government has long had a capacity for these kinds of like massive um, social shutdown measures that just can't be replicated outside of that specific context. It did that, basically killed off the disease within roughly two months um, in China. And now, even now, like, regardless of how much you actually trust the actual numbers, I think it's quite clear from what's going on, the reports coming out, um, bubbling up from the, from, the, from the ground level, and also like any, any remotely plausible observations of you know, hospital, uh, hospitalization levels, and economic activity and so on and so forth. But yeah, like the, 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 the epidemic is under control in China. Uh, and the economy is opening up earlier than virtually any other major economy. And so in all likelihood, the, the overall quite kind of like performance of the Chinese government in that second half of the epidemic has been quite good. Um, I think by any standard, whether its own standards or whether by any kind of international standard. The first half was a series of, a series of seriously botched um, Botched, botched measures. And, you know, objectively speaking, you can't forget the first thing you're talking about the second. But the, the really interesting thing to talk about is like how the politics have played out in light of that two-staged uh, response. So I think it's pretty safe to say that it's, it's, this is virtually unimaginable. If you were following the Chinese social media in say like mid to late January when everyone was freaking out, and there was this massive out, like, uproar of, of anger and frustration at the government. Like at, at that point, I think like, like me and virtually anyone else who has been watching Chinese politics over the past decade, I think we were justified in saying this was the Chinese government's most serious threat um, to its legitimacy in at least the past 20, 20 years, likely longer than that. So, right? like, there was genuinely, genuine uncontrollable social anger and frustration that was being voiced in late January. Now, the 
if you have any memory of that, what's currently going on, as, as far as anyone can tell, uh, on the Chinese internet or amongst Chinese society is virtually unthinkable. This entire epidemic has become a massive uh, domestic public relations win for the government. And it's been, it's become a win basically across two dimensions. First, yes, like they managed to get the thing under control relatively quickly with relatively few deaths, uh, far fewer deaths than you could have imagined had you been following this thing in January. And yes, the economy is opening up again, so that eases off a lot of the pressure. Plus, but the most important thing is China now has the virtue of comparisons with major foreign competitors, especially with the US which I think by any objective measure has botched its, its pandemic response at least as badly as China, even if you take China's first half into consideration. And I think by the, entire, by the time this entire thing is over, we'll likely have just performed worse across virtually any dimension uh, as compared to the Chinese response. So that kind of shot in front of, uh, matched with genuine, genuine nationalist pride has given Xi Jinping a gigantic public relations win. And I think you know, he's, he's really popular with the Chinese population right now. So the question then is what are the lessons that, that the, the, Chinese the Chinese population, the government's gonna come out of this learning? So here, you know, you, you might, here there's a pretty strong likelihood that they're actually gonna learn the wrong lessons, right? So if, if you're looking back at the two-stage response by the Chinese government, it's quite obvious the first, both the success in the, in the second half and the massive failures in the first half all stem from basically the same set of institutional reasons, which is that ever since he entered into power in 2012, Xi has been engaging in this like massive centralization um, program across the Chinese bureaucracy. You know, the Chinese bureaucracy, foreign commentators have a tendency to talk about the Chinese bureaucracy as overly centralized from Mao to now. But in reality, the Chinese, the Chinese government went through this massive decentralization phase um, in the in the in the early 80s, that went on all the way until pretty much like seven eight years ago, um, and that was responsible for for lots of the the economic growth and the and the vibrancy in China um, during that phase. C has had the opposite instincts. He knows he's inheriting a kind of declining economy, a, a economy that's slowing down, obviously, and given that you know he can't rely on the economy to generate as much as much support popularity and legitimacy for him as his predecessors could, his instincts have been basically to ramp up control. And there, uh, part of that has been like regaining control of local governments and rap massively centralizing the Chinese bureaucracy. Um, the end result of that basically has been to create all kinds of mismatches of incentives and principal agent problems that weren't nearly as severe in the past few decades. Um, so that has a lot to do with the delayed response in the earlier phases when local government, when the local, like, when local bureaucrats on the ground in Wuhan really had lots of institutional incentives to try to cover up things even vis-a-vis -vis the central government. Um, so many of the problems stem from the centralization. That said, the effectiveness of the, the second half also stems from the fact that China really now has a pretty well-oiled top-down centralized bureaucracy that can act as a whole at pretty much like a moment's notice if there's enough political will coming down from the top. Um, so I think what's gonna happen, given that right now social sentiment in China is so favorably inclined, to, to the state and its overall handling of the, of the epidemic, what's likely gonna happen basically is the government's gonna learn the wrong lesson and they basically think that it's gonna, over, it's gonna overemphasize the second half as compared to the first half. It has obvious political incentives to do that as well. And the lesson, the lesson that, that's gonna come out of all of this is that our centralized, uh, tightly controlled bureaucracy is responsible for our quote unquote successful um, management of the epidemic. And of course, that's gonna exacerbate the, the problems that led to the first half um, and may very well have severe economic consequences downstream because it's gonna quite seriously deflate economic vibrancy and like the economic agency and policy, policy making initiatives um, going on at the, at the local provincial level where frankly, most of the economic action actually is taking place. So, um, if the Chinese government comes out of this entire thing learning less and it has to, like the centralization actually work this time and therefore we have to centralize more, uh, I think over the long term, like the next five, 10, 15 years, um, it's likely gonna suffer quite some quite serious economic consequences as a result of learning the wrong lesson. But I think at the current moment, that's, what, that's likely what's gonna happen. Um, in terms of like the authoritarianism, again, like China was full-blown authoritarian before this, especially under Xi Jinping, who has um, pretty much engineered the, the most serious crackdown of civil rights in 
post novel PRC history, uh, that's obviously going to continue. You know, like there, there still are large pockets of anger amongst liberal intellectuals who remember the first half and are going to say that um, once this entire thing is over, the, the party is not going to let up on its crackdown and its suppression of these voices. Uh, so plus, again, the, the party has come out of this entire thing, um, playing on the nationalism of the Chinese population and gaining quite a bit of popularity. It's really going to think whatever we did this time kind of worked. And once it thinks like that, it's going to think both the centralization, the, the control, and the oppression, and the suppression of, of social media, that, that's all going to seem like it kind of worked to the party's benefit in the end. Uh, so yeah, China's going to, going to get more authoritarian, but it's going to get more authoritarian in this like nationalism-driven, centralized fashion, um, which in some ways is, is quite troubling because it's going to not only going to sap the country of quite a bit of econo economic energy, but that combination of centralization plus nationalism um, is very often the path that leads authoritarian societies down the path towards full-blown totalitarianism, or perhaps even some version, version of fascism. I still think that's a relatively unlikely outcome for the Chinese government at this point, but the trend obviously is quite worrying, at least in those dimensions. So I'm gonna stop there, and I'm happy as everyone else is, I think, to go into the Q&As. Okay. Th thanks very much, uh, Taisu. Um, <clears throat> you raise a, a very interesting um, question uh, for for all of us. Um, it, it sounds to to simplify greatly uh, your analysis. Uh, the authoritarianism of China um, caused it uh, to delay, obfuscate, deny, hide the crisis at the outset. On the other hand, once um, it was finally recognized, the authoritarianism of the system enabled China to, um, to essentially eradicate uh, the virus, as far as we know, if we believe the data and so forth. Um, and, and it raises sort of a pessimistic uh, message for all the rest of us, in a sense. Um, it, Im it implies that um, the best way to deal with this is um, authoritarian, an authoritarian state uh, that can do the things that China did once it accepted the fact that the uh, virus existed in Wuhan. And, and so it raises, uh, it seems to me for, for others, the, the question of whether, um, whether a democratic polity can respond effectively. Is it, is it democracy uh, that per, uh, makes it difficult to respond? Um, are some democracies more able than others to respond? Or is it, um, does it have more to do with the, um, you might say, not so much the democracy or non-democracy of the regime, but the, the um, authority and expertise of the, um, of the bureaucracy and those who are actually managing the crisis? Um, so so can, I, uh, can I just like really, really briefly to yeah. For like 30 yeah, seconds. Yeah, sure. I, I, mean, I, I don't think the efficiency has much to do with the authoritarian nature. Um, South Korea was every bit just as, just as, just as effective as China was um, in, in, in managing this, this crisis. Germany has been highly effective and plenty of other countries have been relatively effective as well. Um, the, the main thing that seems to determine how effective you are is basically how centralized your resource marshalling is, how capable you are of, of like decisive top-down centralized action, because the, 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 this kind of crisis is not the kind of thing that really can be dealt with effectively in a decentralized way, right? So basically, like the, the more efficient, the more in control the central government is in virtually any, 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 any state system, um, the more likely you're gonna be able to like effectively deal with this kind of thing. China dealt with it through flexing its authoritarian muscle and basically shutting the entire economy down. You can also do it like Germany or South Korea, just like have massive central, centrally driven testing and you're likely gonna reach largely the same results. Um, the problem with the US response obviously has been the complete lack of federal leadership. Basically, was everything's being left to the state. Some of the states are actually quite competent, but that that, that can't solve the national problem. Right? Like, you know, a good response in California or Washington, or even as we're seeing now, a relatively competent response in the Northeast, 
in the face of this explosion is not going to save the entire country basically from from basically having this massive spread. So China's main virtue in that case was the centralization, not necessarily authoritarianism. Yeah, it, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting question because as you pointed out, Germany has done well. On the other hand, it's a federal system. The U.S. obviously hasn't. It's a federal system. So then the question is. Um, it, it's, it may not be central, uh, centralized versus decentralized or federal versus right. unitary, but yeah, maybe yeah, I, other I, yeah, features yeah. of the systems. Yeah, I agree. Th those formalistic def differences don't matter nearly as much, just basically how centrally coordinated this particular response was. Germany has a federal, general, Germany has a federal system with a very coordinated centralized policy right. response in which everyone was, was acting pretty much as a whole. The U.S. everyone was at the time for themselves, and the central was non-existent. But that's the difference, not the formal federal structure of the government, basically. Right. So is this more a question of uh, the, you might say, the bureaucratic, uh, the the centralization of, and the authority of those in a federal government who are, have responsibility yeah. for this yeah. domain of policy? Yeah. I, I would say that the, in the end, the critical thing is just like the holistic marshaling of national resources and you can do that in a, in, a, in a federal system as long as everyone's on the same page right but of course it, it perhaps it's kind of easier in kind of like a more top-down centralized system like, like like you have in china or south korea but mm. certainly you can have coordination mm. Mm. Uh, nahid I, I, i'd like to ask you about uh, following up on your point about the um the health system uh in in iran and and the fact that it was seen as very effective, very capable. Uh, and um, I, think you, I think you said it's um, now become the, the national hero uh, in terms of uh, dealing with the crisis. Um, uh, how do you, how, just from taking from that case, how do you, how do you fit that into the uh, kind of um, analysis that Taisu has presented in terms of and the question is: It is it a unitary federal? Is that the distinction? Is it something about the bureaucracy and the organization? Is it uh, something to do with the respect for health professionals? Um, uh, some countries have, as we know from this country, some countries have more of that collective respect uh, mm -hmm. for the health professionals than others. Um, how would you how would you react to that uh, yeah, analysis so on, that he gave us? Right, right. So on Taisu's point about authoritarianism, I agree because you know Iran has been has uh, the Iranian government has been willing to uh, wield its authoritarian means when it's uh, when it comes down to political matters of you know state survival, such as in during protests and so on. And we've seen that. But when it came down to the coronavirus, actually, it hasn't really dealt in authoritarian means in terms of the kinds of measures that China, for example, took or other countries have taken. Um, and so it really was this underlying existing structure of the healthcare system, which in Iran, there's, I imagine, you know, across the world, that is true. But in Iran in particular, I can tell you there's a lot of, there's a, there's great respect for the medical profession and also this historical identity with, you know, Avicenna having been one of the first sort of, uh, you know, modern doctor, um, inventor of modern medicine. And so their historical roots as well that uh, allows Iranian to, Iranians to sort of identify themselves as a sort of seat of modern medicine. And Iran has a very high output of medical research. I think it's 16th or so in the world in terms of medical research. And it has a very high ratio of doctors to people, um, high ratio of hospital beds. And so there is that respect, but also with the revolution, what happened, even though the medical system was great before the revolution, but the, the population was half its size now, actually less than half its size now. But with the revolution, the idea of the revolution was that um, the downtrodden, the, the poor would be, would be served by the new government. And this is something that was implemented through a social welfare system, including a um, efficient healthcare system that has station, mobile stations and local units all the way deep into rural and provincial areas. And so I think, um, you know, the healthcare system was able to step in, but I think, you know, it, it would be wrong to Obviously, this is a it is a federal system. 
and um, the health minister, but the health ministry associated with the current moderate government of President Rouhani and the government at, uh, at large have been really criticized for their lack of action um, on taking measures and providing the kinds of equipment that, that the healthcare workers have needed. And it's what we've seen is more of a, this, these existing structures and then bottom up support by people, ordinary people in many cases, of providing and you know making things in their homes and supplying these places, but also also a self-sufficiency that has existed because of the sanctions. So because of these harsh US sanctions for decades, Iran um, creates, produces 98% of its own medication, although it's still reliant on imports for for um, content that goes into that medication. So the sanctions are still having a horrible impact even in the medical field, but it's, it's self-sufficient in terms of the medical field. It's become self-sufficient in producing medical equipment, me uh, medicines, and so on. And, um, you know, and because, and I think that the sanctions are an important factor to consider in everything that's happened with the coronavirus, including in its relation with China, for example, when, um, most countries shut down their flights to China. Iran did so formally as well, but one of these, its main airlines for another three weeks um, had continued to have flights to China. And this happened after um, an Iranian minister met with a Chinese ambassador in Tehran. And so because of the Western sanctions, Iran has, relying, has been relying more and more um, on China and Russia. And so they, these new patterns of dependency have also played an important role in how the virus has played out in Iran. Um, Anna and Thais, I wondered if you could um, uh, say something about the, the this this um, issue or the, the analysis that Taisu tai was talking about in terms of the structure of the government and, and how that has uh, affected uh, either hindered or enhanced uh, the uh, effectiveness of the response. Um, I mean, it, does, does federalism, we know that federalism is variable. Uh, Germany did well, uh, the US hasn't done well. Um, how do you, how do you, and then of course the question that Tai Su raised, uh, maybe it's not uh, that issue so much is just the uh, the centralization of, of authority, and and then we get into the question of the the um, professional healthcare and the and the, its ability to essentially um, uh, drive the response uh, as opposed to being subordinated to political leaders. Could you say something about um, all of those issues in the countries uh, you know, um, and and of course you know. You know several countries, many countries. So, um, uh, Anna, would would you have something uh, to say about that? It, sure. Yes, yeah, definitely. A very interesting. It's a very interesting question. I think that to start with, I don't see in Latin America a relationship, a clear relationship between political regimes and how they are responding to the crisis. Uh, so there, there are authoritarian regimes in the region that are doing very badly. Like, let's think about Venezuela. So, uh, and then there are democracies that are doing very badly too. So think about, for instance, Ecuador. Um, so, so I don't see a relationship. Now in terms of the federalism and its structure, I think for instance, in the Mexican case, Mexico is a federal system. The government started with a more lax attitude to the crisis than what various governors wanted. So subnational governments have been uh, demanding uh, more stringent policies, more testing, more equipment, uh, um, a more aggressive response to the economic crisis too. So in that sense, I think that maybe decentralization will at some point help uh, Mexico as opposed to uh, be a drawback. But the problem is, of course, that partisanship gets in the way. So one of the problems is that I see is that coordination between the central government and governors is very much moderated by the partisanship of governors. And that, of course, might become a huge problem, uh, both in terms of how resources are distributed to deal with the health crisis, and then, of course, what will happen afterwards with the economic crisis. Um, 
Other countries in the Southern Cone have also federal systems, but slightly more centralized than the Mexican one. Uh, overall, they all seem to be doing relatively okay uh, in the response to the crisis. I'm just thinking here about Chile and Argentina, uh, which uh, of course have seen uh, a serious increase in the number of cases and deaths, but, but I, I don't see reports of their health system on the verge of collapse, uh, like what we have seen in Ecuador, for instance, which is a really tragic story. Um, so, so, in, so in that sense, I think that it is true that um, coordination is essential, I, I, but I don't think that necessarily the full concentration of power in presence is, is what will help these countries turn the page. And I think that it is important to continue to have some vibrancy in subnational governments uh, and, and to a certain degree allow them to also do their own experimentation on both how to deal with the health crisis and the economic crisis. Uh, and ju just to say, uh, most of the health systems in the region uh, were not, were not, were not uh, as prepared as what some other panelists have mentioned. Uh, certainly the Mexican case the health system was underfunded before COVID-19, continues to be underfunded. There's lack of equipment, lack of doctors, um, and certainly lack of logistics in terms of figuring out uh, how to stretch resources. So, so that is a problem. Thais, um, what, what, what do you think uh, from yes. your perspective? Yes, I'll, I'll just uh, complete a little bit uh, regarding Brazil, because um, for us the problem is, as I said, the president is uh, denial, in a denial mo mode. So um, uh, gov governors, the state governors, federalism now, uh, he uh, has helped Brazil because they are acting. So governors, they are together, uh, they they have a virtual meeting as we are having now. They have virtual meetings and they are speaking with themselves and trying to 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 deal with the the problem. And they are sharing some experience, some uh, some tests, and they are, um, for example, they are uh, experiencing some tests in the in South Brazil. Porto, uh, Rio, Rio Grande do Sul, there is a state called Rio Grande do Sul in the south, and they are uh, uh, testing some tests, and then they are going to share with other states, but the, the central government uh, is completely ahead, uh, not ahead, but uh, a part of all that, and so um, there is no coordination uh, governors are coordinating themselves. And so, and as Anna just said, uh, we are, we have a lack of everything, equipment and um, logistic and everything, but they are trying, governors are trying to help themselves. That's, that's it. <laughs> uh, that, that sounds sounds very American about the governors uh, <laughs> helping themselves. Uh, that, uh, sitting here in Connecticut um, and a part of the new northeastern caucus of uh, governors uh, that exists, uh, which actually is doing something. Um, and Eniko, I wondered if I could ask you something about uh, something you said um, in talking about Hungary. Um, and in particular, ask you, you alluded very briefly to Poland and Slovenia uh, and, and to what extent um, the, do you think in the um, countries of Central and Eastern Europe, the Hungarian response is seen as an effective kind of response and does it make um, uh, does it make uh, more people more inclined to uh, 
say, well, a liberal democracy is not such a bad thing. Look what Viktor Orban's doing. Um, um, I mean, I can easily imagine that there were people in Warsaw uh, in the uh, uh, um, law and justice uh, leadership who, um, who think that what he's done is exactly right. Um, but I wonder about other countries, uh, Slovenia, Slovakia, so forth. Could you say a bit about whether his response is, is a general one or is it just, this is Viktor Orban and, and you can't generalize about anything beyond the borders of Hungary? So, of course, uh, my response is based on, mostly based on primary research and secondary opinions through my colleagues. And, uh, well, I do think that something that we can all agree on, that he is way more influential than he should be. Hungary is such a tiny country in the middle of the, in the middle of uh, Europe and in the middle of the EU. And yet, uh, he definitely set a path that now multiple leaders want to follow. Now, as far as illiberal democracy uh, and whether is this a path to follow, I, I do think that unfortunately uh, the path that he laid down, especially with his uh, extreme right ideologies and conservative and anti-immigration ideologies, it's something that, that many countries around us picked up on. I think that's undoubtable. Um, there, is this, there is a really interesting question also in the Q&A that I might just address because we have a Polish student, Haider, who was asking me about, do, do we think that Poland is, and why, or why would I think that, Daria, I'm sorry, that, that uh, Poland is also anti-authoritarian? And, um, and so I, in order to answer that question, I went back and I started to think about when did I start to think that Orban's regime is an anti-authoritarian regime? What, what, what were those points? And if I look back the past uh, 10 years, um, the way he's been attacking and seizing uh, the judiciary system, attacking the free press, uh, taking full control of the economy through oligarchies, all of these, all of these are the different acts that together will turn or turn, has turned his regime into what I would consider as an authoritarian regime. Now with his most recent actions, I did make the argument that the, uh, to me, uh, this is when a like he, he acts as a dictator for, for many reasons. Um, and something that I, I've noticed, but I think my colleagues should either support or correct me in this matter, is that many of the measurements that he did during five, six, seven, eight years have, have taken place in an accelerated manner in Poland, in Slovenia. So, so the gradual transition that, that was happening, and I think we are definitely, we've been arriving for a while now, uh, that gradual process has been accelerated in Poland. And so to answer, Daria, your question, um, you, you know, maybe I, I was not, like I would not necessarily make the argument that it is an authoritarian regime, Poland at this moment, but we, we're looking at the measurements that are happening in relation to the judiciary system, in relation to, to freedom rights, in relation to, uh, to um, the refugee question. I think we are, we are following the very same steps that Hungary took many, at this point, unfortunately, many years ago, sadly. Okay, um, I, I'm sorry that we, we are going to have to close um, uh, our discussion very shortly, but um, before we do, I'd like to ask uh, Vish uh, uh, if, if you'd like to uh, get into this conversation and, uh, and, and in particular, um, um, how you look comparatively speaking uh, at, that is at, at both Algeria and and Morocco, uh, and and in looking at the responses of those two countries, do you think they look at all to near neighbors to the north, such as France and Spain, in terms of how those countries, which have of course suffered immense, and Italy for that matter suffered immense uh, losses of life um, in terms of how to deal with the problem. Is there any sense of learning 
um, uh, do you think in terms of how uh, um, everyone would like to respond the way China did, but everyone isn't China and can't do that, obviously. Uh, are there any lessons to be learned for Algeria, Morocco, uh, other countries, uh, and, and, and more broadly in Africa? I mean, uh, you know, the, the huge uncertainty, uh, of course, is where this will go next and how, what effect it will have when, uh, when the virus begins to spread widely in, uh, in Africa. Um, yeah, so I think one of the, the ironies of, um, you know, North Africa as kind of being understood as always kind of looking to Europe as a model. Um, the irony of the, the COVID scenario is in many ways, Europe has become sort of the anti-model for, for, for North Africa and for Africa, I think, in, in general, and for the Middle East as well. Um, I remember there were a lot of, you know, jokes in the onion about how Africa is closing its borders from Europe. Uh, from Europeans coming in in order to keep the virus out. Um, and as you mentioned correctly, a lot of people are looking to China or just the Asian countries in general um, as models in their handling of the crisis. And I think both Morocco and Algeria were sort of hopefully relying on the fact that they are in fact authoritarian much in the way that China is in order to be able to kind of quickly uh, sort of manage the crisis and, um, and sort of act quickly and unilaterally um, without some of the um, the the handicaps, uh, if, if we can call it that, uh, that sort of federalist uh, systems and democratic systems are kind of facing um, in handling the crisis in a more swift way. Uh, so I think some, an, another interesting thing is if we compare, uh, you know, Morocco and, and Algeria is, um, there's one of the questions in the comments asks about social trust and how important that is. Um, you know, as I mentioned in my talk, public trust in Algeria is very, very low. In Morocco, on the other hand, it's very, very high. Um, and even though both of these countries are um, in many ways similar uh, in the sense that they're both what many political scientists would call, you know, hybrid authoritarian regimes. They use democratic institutions that don't really have many, in fact, prerogatives. Um, you know, one is a republic and one is a monarchy. And, you know, I'm still kind of in the stages of fleshing out to what extent the monarchy versus the republic uh, model uh, is relevant um, to to the to the question of legitimacy and public trust, especially uh, in COVID. I think it's still a little bit um, tentative and unclear. Um, but but what I can say is that over the course of the last several years, uh, Algeria has sort of struggled to concentrate authority in a single centralized source in the way that Morocco has. Uh, you know, in Morocco, the foreign policy establishment, its religious institutions, and even its military sort of function in tandem to uphold uh, the monarchy and the logic of, of, its, of its legitimacy. And it's a legitimacy that is sort of implicitly and explicitly uh, religious while the more internally fragmented Algerian state has struggled at various points uh, to concentrate authority in a single source. In fact, some of the slogans of the Hirak movement that I mentioned in my talk is, you know, Algeria has no king and we're a republic, not a monarchy. So it's implicitly sort of highlighting this like non-monarchiness uh, uh, and, 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 and calling out the illegitimacy of the Algerian state, which is quite ironic. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but there is, a question in the in the audience about um, that was directed to me that is a bit related to what I'm asking about to to, uh, to your question the impact to the move online by the Hirak movement and this was posed by Hannah um, and whether I see this as creating a collective action or commitment issue or strengthening the movement uh, long term um, I don't know if we have time for me to answer that question. Um, uh, you, yeah, you could. Um, I think um, uh, we we do need to wrap up. So maybe briefly, and then we'll just uh, wrap up. Yeah. Yeah. So just to answer Hannah's question on this, um, yeah, I think it's definitely a challenge. Um, as I mentioned in in in, in my comments, uh, you know, the lack of public space, you know, the physical coming together was very very important um, in order both to join together groups that were ideologically uh, diverse, uh, to allow them to sort of convert together on, on a sort of unifying platform, um, but also in a way that reveals to authoritarian regimes uh, their strength. Uh, the comments I made about revealing what people's actual preferences were, the strength of their numbers, 
um, the Hirak was able to establish the sort of massive legitimacy because of its strength in numbers, something that was made very obvious by its show in the streets. By mobilizing only online, it's very difficult to discern what is the size of the movement, what is the strength of the movement, what is the sway and influence of the movement. Um, so yes, the shift to online is definitely going to be a challenge. But what the Hirak, um, one of the advantages that Hirak has is that over the last year, it has started already sort of established itself um, as a major, major player in Algerian politics. And so the shift to online, as you mentioned, the question about collective action and commitment issues, um, you know, the free rider problem is sort of this endemic problem to social movements. A lot of people who sort of towards the end of Hirak, right before COVID started, um, people were sort of begin, you know, you know, you know, Ramadan was coming up, it was cold in the winter time, a lot of people were beginning to sort of sit out the movement. And there's this question of, you know, well, why should I go out and march when, other, when these other people are sort of carrying uh, the mantle for me? And many people were also beginning to ask whether protests were enough to elicit um, meaningful concessions from the regime. So the question you're asking is actually a question that the movement is, itself is, uh, is uh, sort of wrestling with. Um, and sort of, you know, it's an open question. So while I cannot really predict uh, the future, um, I think, on the part of many free riders, um, if you know, not to not to use the term pejoratively, um, but in speaking to many of them, many there's a sort of a widespread fear that COVID may be sort of the death knell for Iraq, and so many are wondering whether this will sort of, uh, you know, shock the free riders out of complacency and um, you know lead them to join back in the streets whenever the the lockdown lifts. I mean, it it, it remains to be seen, but I hope that that answers. Your question, at least yeah. for now. Um, Thais, I think um, I think you wanted to make a comment, and I think this will be the last word. Um, so, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, that just because uh, there are some uh, questions, um, they uh, are also from the audience. Uh, one is from Roberto Castellanos. Uh, to what extent does trust in government and social trust in general matter to have a more effective response to the COVID-19 pandemic or and crisis? Um, I think that uh, the correlation is completely um, the 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 response that we are going to have from each government, it depends on the, the trust that the, the people, people has in the government. So I, I think that's completely collected. Sorry. <laughs> Great. Um, well, I want to thank uh, all of you um, for participating in this. We've been uh, going for almost two hours and uh, we could go much longer, um, uh, but uh, we do have to uh, uh, bring it to a conclusion. So I just want to thank uh, each of you, uh, and of course, especially thank uh, Christina and Kathleen, uh, who put uh, this together technically, and to thank especially also uh, all of the audience and all of the people who have um, written in. and and those of us who got questions uh, will um, uh, try to respond to you, uh, if not uh, in this format, in another format. But again, thank you to each of uh, you for participating and spending all this time and uh, bringing so much enlightenment to this uh, uh, important uh, issue. So thank you and uh, goodbye. <laughs>